Hey there guys, this week we're going to do separation of powers, which I think should be relatively straightforward. I think the key thing to remember when you're writing an essay on this topic is that not only should the three powers, so the executive, the legislature and the judiciary be separate, but there should also be checks and balances between each of the three of those powers. So that's something we're going to have a look at today in more detail. I um, hope you enjoyed the lecture. So when considering any topic, I always think it's best to start with a little bit of historical background and some definitions. And for separation of powers, we go back to Aristotle, who wrote the politics in the 4th century BC. Aristotle identified three elements to any constitution, public assembly, officers of the state and the judicial department. And we can translate this into sort of modern UK system by thinking of the public assembly as being parliament, officers of the state being the prime minister and the cabinet, and the judicial department obviously being the courts and the judiciary. Now this idea from Aristotle wasn't really developed until Locke, who in his second treatise of government talked about the what would happen if one person held all three roles that Aristotle talked about. In other words, one person not only made up the laws, they also enforced the laws and also decided how those laws would be interpreted. Now, not surprisingly, Locke came to the conclusion that this would effectively turn any country into a dictatorship. And so he argued strongly in favour of the separation of these powers, but also a system of checks and balances to exist between them, as I mentioned in the introduction. Finally, before we move on, Montesquieu in his De l'Esprit des Lois um, gave us the modern definition of the separation of powers. Um, and he, in fact, looked to England, which had recently had the Civil War, um, and gave us what we define the separation to be today. So between the executive branch, the legislative branch and the judicial branch. So the main question we're going to ask is, is there separation of powers in the UK? I think my overall argument is going to be that, yes, there is separation of powers in the UK, but there are areas where it could be better or there's more that could be done. So let's have a look at the three different branches. So I have David Cameron here, obviously representing the executive, Parliament as the legislature, and this judge here as the judiciary. So we're going to look at each connection between the two, uh, between the three of them in turn and see how we get on. So the first one we're going to do is between the executive and the legislature. And in the 19th century, the political scientist Walter Badgett was very critical of this uh, relationship between the legislature and executive and described it as nearly a complete fusion. And this isn't surprising because the prime minister is a member of parliament himself. So David Cameron has is a constituency MP. His, I think his constituency is near Oxford. His cabinet ministers are exactly the same position, so that they all have constituencies as well. Um, but one thing that we do have to bear in mind before being too critical is that the definition that Aristotle provided us of the executive, um, which is sort of the officers of government, extends much further than simply the prime minister and the cabinet. So it would also extend to, for example, the civil service, also to the police and to the army as well, where obviously that, that fusion doesn't exist. So in terms of the checks that apply, um, the legislature, legislature can in theory hold the executive to account through a vote of no confidence. But realistically, it's probably the other way around where the executive holds much more power over the legislature. And this is because of the parliamentary system that we have in the UK. So the governments, because of the first past the post system, often have a large majority. The Conservatives at the moment only have a majority of 30. Uh, I think it's about 30, but it's more than enough to make sure that there aren't going to be um, enough Conservative MPs to vote against the government uh, and bring it down effectively. Also, government whips play an effective role as well. So MPs who vote with the government or with the executive um, will be rewarded with nice jobs. Um, whereas other MPs who don't always vote with the government might be punished in some sort of way. So um, that might be overlooked for certain positions 
or um, challenged by their constituency party, as I mentioned there. So I think the overall party system in the UK has a big thing to do with the lack of separation of powers between the legislature and the executive. A lot of people probably don't know who their MP is, but they might know that they're a Labour supporter or a Conservative supporter. And so it doesn't really matter who the what MP's name is on the ballot paper. It just matters who which party they're representing. Some have argued that this effectively leads to an elective dictatorship. And I think there is a strong argument for that at the moment. If you think about Scotland in the last general election, um, I think 56 of their 59 seats went to the SNP, the Scottish National Party. But the Conservatives won the overall election. So even though Scotland overwhelmingly supported the SNP, the Conservatives rule over Scotland as they do in Northern Ireland, Wales and England. So there is some crossover as well. Ministers can make delegated legislation. Um, this is called secondary legislation or statutory instruments. Um, so that's effectively the executive performing a legislative function. Uh, and the legislature also perform an executive function because of the UK's dualist system. So they sign off on treaties. So when the EU joined the uh, when the UK sorry joined the EU, um, the Parliament effectively had to ratify the treaty itself by passing the European Communities Act 1972 uh, to ensure the sovereignty of Parliament. So the dualist system means that the legislature was exercising executive powers in that instance. So let's move on and look between the executive, so the cabinet and the judiciary this time. I think there's a lot more separation here although this wasn't always the case. Um, so the role of the Lord Chancellor was something that was criticised before the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 was passed. And this is because the Lord Chancellor before this, um, before 2005, had a foot in all three elements of government. So he, was, he appointed judges and was a judge in the highest court, so he performed a judicial function, presiding officer of the House of Lords, which was a legislative function, and he was also a member of the cabinet, which is obviously an executive function. Fortunately, after the Constitutional Reform Act 2005, there was a greater move towards separation of powers and the role of the Lord Chancellor um, became much smaller. So now the Judicial Appointments Commission appoints judges. Um, this is an independent body separate from government. Um, presiding officer of the House of Lords is now uh, the Lord Speaker. And uh, while the Lord Chancellor is still technically a member of the cabinet, he is also most primarily uh, the Secretary of State for Justice. So the Lord Chancellor has a much smaller role in the UK now, thanks to that Constitutional Reform Act 2005. But yes, as I said, the, ind uh, the independence of the judiciary is not something that's really open to question. And you can read that quote from Lord Justice Nolan there. To give a little bit of background to M and Home Office, in this case, a member of the cabinet, the Home Secretary, sent an immigrant back to its country um, without proper, without a proper hearing in court. Um, and the House of Lords, in this case, said, "Well, this person, this immigrant, should have had a proper hearing." And so they brought the immigrant back to the UK just so that they could hold the proper hearing. Um, so the in, we can say in this case that the cabinet minister effectively tried to exercise a judicial function and this wasn't allowed and so the House of Lords took a very stern view of it as you can see from Lord Justice Nolan's quote. And there is a little bit of crossover though so whole life tariffs so uh, for criminals that are deemed to be particularly dangerous the Home Secretary can impose a whole life sentence on particular criminals, um, which is sort of a judicial function, I guess. Also, we talked earlier about secondary legislation that ministers can make. Well, the courts also have the power to render it null and void through a process called judicial review, which we'll look at in a later lecture. So there is um, something of a crossover between the two, but there is a greater degree of uh, independence between the judiciary and the executive overall. Finally, just before we do move on, there is a bit of crossover of functions as well. So administrative tribunals are an element of the judiciary, 
but they decide on matters of public law, so uh, on questions that would surround the executive. Also, certain judicial um, decisions do eventually fall to the ministers. So in areas such as planning law, for example, um, the final route of appeal might be to the minister directly rather than to a particular court. So the final connection that we have to look at is between the legislature and the judiciary. Um, and previously, the House of Lords, which was the highest court in the country, did exist in the legislature, so in the Parliament building that is uh, obviously very famous with Big Ben on the side of it. Um, as part of the reforms from the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 that we mentioned earlier in relation to the Lord Chancellor, it was decided that in order to increase the separation between the legislature and the judiciary, that the highest court in the land should have its own separate building. And so this is this picture here is of Middlesex Guildhall, which is opposite Parliament, um, and it gave birth to the Supreme Court in 2009, which, as you'll know, is now the highest court in the UK. Um, and so we do have that greater physical separation between the legislature and the judiciary now. But let's have a look, see if there is actually practical um, separation as well. So parliamentary sovereignty would indicate that um, the legislature shouldn't be impacted on by the judiciary. But in reality, the judiciary do have certain powers in this regard. So they have the power to interpret the legislation that the legislature passes in certain ways. Also, Section 2 of the European Communities Act 1972 um, is basically the legislature telling the judiciary to, uh, to apply UK law in a certain way, i.e. in line with the judgments of the European Court of Justice and with European law in general. I can also see Section 4 of the Human Rights Act 1998 um, is the idea of declaration of incompatibility. And this is arguably the judiciary having a crossover into legislative function um, because they are striking down particular pieces of law, although not really striking them down um, because it's still with the power of the minister to either rectify the um, legislation or to leave it as it is. So there is a bit of a crossover in those areas. Also in the common law as well, um, Crown against R, the 1991 case, was a, a marital rape. Uh, and marital rape in 1991 was st still technically legal in the UK, but the judges decided that this was obviously so abhorrent that they would ignore um, the law that was in place and set by Parliament and create its own law through, through common law as well. Also, other areas of common law, such as tort law, which you may also be studying at the moment, are areas that are particularly dominated by judge-made law. So in areas such as tort law, um, there aren't many statutes in place or pieces of primary or secondary legislation that affect the law. And um, this is essentially something that is developed through the judicial system itself. Similar things can be said about equity, the law of equity as, equity as well. So to what extent can the legislature hold the judiciary to account? Well, they can criticise their judgments, but they can't really criticise the judges themselves. So you'll often hear um, members of parliament uh, using their parliamentary privilege to um, rail against judgments that the Supreme Court or the High Court might have made, but they can't criticise the judges themselves. In theory, Parliament does have the power to remove judges, but this, isn't, uh, this wouldn't be done simply because they didn't like a particular judgment. It's normally something to, more to do with um, something that the judge themselves will have done wrong. Uh, and this isn't used very often either. I think the last time that a, a judge was actually removed from office through the parliamentary procedure was in 1830, when an Irish judge who had been caught fiddling his taxes was forcibly removed by a vote, um, a vote of no confidence in, in, in both houses of parliament. So coming back to our original question, it's, it's probably quite useful to draw a quick comparison with the U, United States. Um, here there is much greater degree of separation of powers. 
So if we look at Obama here, and this is Congress, and this is the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, in the US, Obama is not a congressman. So he has his own White House, uh, which he lives and works from, and that's very separate to Congress, which we have up here. Um, so there's greater separation between the legislature and the executive to the extent that um, Obama, who is a Democrat, can lead the what from the White House, whilst the legislature is actually led by the opposing party, the Republicans. Um, similarly, the Supreme Court has had its own building for much longer than the UK has, and there is a much greater degree of separation there. Um, the Senate do appoint judges, um, and there is uh, something of that being a political process in the same way that it isn't really with the Judicial Appointments Commission in the UK now. Um, but there is such a greater degree of separation that exists there. Each has its own domain of power. So the courts in the US interpret the law. The president is mainly concerned with areas of foreign policy and the Congress is mainly associated with creating and making domestic law. So while the UK probably isn't as good as in the US in terms of separation of powers, um, I still think it probably does a pretty good job overall, although there are still improvements that could be made. Um, who cares whether the UK has separation of powers? This is quite an interesting argument that's been made by a couple of academics. Jennings has argued that it's not really relevant as, uh, as long as judges are independent. So this fusion that we have between the executive and the legislature in the UK it doesn't really make any difference. In fact, it probably makes things better because whereas in the US where the Republicans hold Congress and Obama, uh, who's a Democrat, holds the White House, that can mean that legislation doesn't really get passed at all and it can lead to gridlock. At least in the UK system, things actually get done. So that separation of powers between the legislature and the executive isn't that important as long as the judiciary is separate because they're the ones who ultimately interpret the law and it's important that they do so independently of the governing party. Um, Barber has also said that instead of focusing on this uh, or fetishizing this idea of um, separation of powers, the focus should instead be on efficiency. So in a similar way to that I've talked about, at least in the UK, laws get passed and things get done. Um, then that is the important thing. I, I, I guess I can see the point of that argument, but I, I would probably point you also back as well to consider the idea we talked about earlier of an elective dictatorship. So overall, separation of powers is a bit of an artificial dividing line between the parts of the government. Uh, it's basically something that we've created ourselves and sought to limit government power. But it's not something that physically exists or something that can be measured in any particular way, um, which gives you great scope for answering your questions and talking about how these blurred lines between the different branches of government exist and merge. Um, but nevertheless, I think even today in the 21st century, separation of powers is of practical importance and it also links to an idea of the rule of law, which is something we're going to talk about next week in my next lecture. So if you're answering a question on the separation of powers, I think it pretty much structures itself. You can look at the links between the three elements of government, the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. Take each one in turn and think about whether there is or there isn't separation of powers. If you want extra marks, you can also think about like the historical background, as we talked about at the start. And also, as we talked about at the end, whether you think that separation of powers is actually still as important in the 21st century or whether our focus should really be more on government efficiency and being able to get things done. In my view, I think it does still hold an important role in our democracy, but we shouldn't be obsessing over the separation of powers um, to the extent that it affects the work that government is able to do. So thanks very much for wa watching. As I mentioned, next week I'll be doing the rule of law. So make sure you subscribe so that you get notifications when that is available. Uh, please leave a like if you enjoyed the video. And as always, if you have any questions, then leave them in the comments below. Thanks very much. Bye.